my concern is also uh, to encourage multimedia, but I want it to be sustainable. I want you guys, I want me to be able to go out and make a living doing this stuff, pay the bills, raise the kids, and come back to fight another day. So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about. So clearly things have changed. You recognize that person there? It's a little uh, my old do. Anyway, what's changed here for us and how can we adapt to it? How can we adapt to it as journalists? How can we adapt to it as business people? That's my thing. Okay, so... Um, so that's my story. Uh, we live in a really exciting time. We have all these great tools. Uh, but how do we manage them all so that they don't drag us down, so that we can stay focused? So this is the way it used to be, right? Back in the days when dinosaurs roamed the Earth, we had jobs or we had agents. I started out with agents. I haven't had, pulled a salary since 1981. Uh, but I've had an agent since 1981, or I've had a series of agents. Uh, so some of you, how many here are actually in salaried positions right now? How many of here used to be in salaried positions? Ah, you see? How many of you here think you're going to be in salaried positions in 10 years? Oh, I don't see a single hand. <laughs> a couple reaching up there. Things are really changing. Uh, we used to have salaries, we used to have rational fee structures. Right now, the fee structure that we're living under is frozen in time in about 1994. Okay? Our fees haven't gone up a bit, but our operating costs have and the complexity of our businesses have. So we have to adapt to that. We used to have co-workers. These were people who did stuff with us. We've been talking a lot about the importance of, of, of collaboration and team building here. We used to have that built in. Some of you who are on salaried positions still do. Uh, but, but increasingly, we're having to fend for ourselves. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that. So we used to be able to focus on the thing we're good at, on being journalists, but it's just not as simple as it used to be, right? So uh, flexible workforce, that's us, right? Uh, our publishers pull us in when they need us. When they don't need us, they don't need us, right? Uh, new media jobs, anybody here ever kind of rummage around out on Craigslist to see what they're hiring when you have one of those bad days and you go, I need a real job? I mean. You don't see a lot of opportunities under the listing photojournalist. What you see is a lot of opportunities under flash developers, under database developers, that kind of thing. All right, so the value has shifted in the employment marketplace. As a matter of fact, my friend Tomas over here was telling me the other day, what was it, Tomas, 30,000 students graduated from photography programs last year in the United States? According to Photo District News, 30,000. Photographers graduated. One of the things when I taught at the Art Institute of Seattle, I used to do the horror story thing, and I would, I would explain to my students that uh, they had as good a chance of success in their field as the average high school basketball player has getting into the NBA. You know, I mean that's an exaggeration, but 10% is a very, very high success rate for students going through programs right now. You know, and the average pay for a, a photographer. Not just a photojournalist, we're probably at the low end, but a photographer in, in the United States today, $29,000 a year. So live in a metro area and live on that. Uh, <clears throat> so these are real issues that you have to face, and if you're going to do the work, you've got to figure out how to work around that stuff. All right, because we've already seen what's happening out here. We've got Flickr, YouTube, etc. It's a commodity universe, right? This is the reality. It, we're, we live in a, in a universe where content is a commodity. So we've been bitching and moaning about it for years, right? And uh, it's now I think most of us are getting over it. We're realizing can't complain anymore. We're going to get caught in the tsunami if we do. We can't stop the tides. We better live with it and find a new way. Okay, so here's the reality, though, right? Don't you love my cow? That guy is actually the CEO of Dairy Gold, but he could be a publisher, and that could be me poking the nose into the camera there. You know, the thing about ranchers or, or dairy farmers and cows is this guy loves his cows, right? But if that cow quits giving milk, that cow becomes dog food, okay? So we can be, how do you avoid being dog food? That's the question. All right, and then these are lemmings. I'm on an animal theme here, as you will see. Um, I could have, the other, the other possibility would be to have the cows moving across the pasture, 
Because what we've done is, with all this crowding supply and demand issue in the marketplace, all these photographers and multimedia producers and things that are newly minted in, in the communications marketplace, we're all kind of moving over from traditional ways of telling stories to new ways. So we're moving from where the grass is already eaten to the other side of the pasture, where it will also soon be eaten. Or, like lemmings, we're hurling ourselves off the cliff after one another. How are we doing that? Well, what we're doing is we're trying so hard to compete, that, but we're, a lot of us are competing in the wrong way. We're trying to compete on price, which is really stupid, uh, because that is a race to the bottom. And uh, we all know, uh, everybody who works in this business knows about getting underbid, and they know about, uh, you know, like, uh, well, you know, what does MSNBC pay for a story? I mean, probably not a living wage, right? And th it's just the, the nature of the marketplace. People are out there putting two weeks in on a story. I talked to an editor yesterday who said that he knew of somebody who'd put two weeks in on a story for $500. You cannot make a living doing that. You won't survive. But they said, well, you know, it's going to look good in my book. Well, yeah, when you're driving a bus, you know. Anyhow, so these are perplexing issues, right? So, so I met this nice man, Tom Curley, at the Online News Association gathering a few years ago. And I'm surrounded in this room by hundreds and hundreds of, of managing editors from online, you know, news sites from around the country. And he does this speech about content is king, and, you know, infrastructure doesn't mean jack unless you have good stuff to put in there, and I'm all for content. And I, Mr. Curley, I'm, yes, and I'm a photojournalist, and if that's true, why have you fired all your content providers, and why do you pay freelancers $75 a day? <laughs> well, that's true, you know. I mean, at the time, they were paying freelancers 75 bucks an assignment. Make a living on that. And he looked at me, and he kind of stopped. And had people lining up. And he did, yeah, man, that's what I'm saying, competing on price. So, but he looked at me, and he... He said, he told me right there in the whole audience, he said, well, you know what, though, you're in luck because the stuff that everybody goes to on our websites, far and away, kicks ass. Photographs, slideshows, cute puppy pictures, you know, the weekend pictures, whatever. I mean, it just goes way beyond any other kind of content out there. So we're producing the most popular stuff out there for 75 bucks a day. It just doesn't make sense, right? And I said, after the event, I said, but Mr. Curley, this doesn't make sense. What are we going to do about it? And he said, he said, make more. That's why the bunnies there, you know, the fornicating bunnies. He said, what you have to do is make more. And, I, and I'm thinking, okay, well, that's easy for you to say because, um, you know, you don't, you don't own a little teeny business like me. You aren't a recently, or like all my friends, you aren't this recently fledged freelancer who's out there. How do you scale those? How do you do that? How do you, you know, clone yourself to go out and make more stuff? You just can't do it, right? So what you have to do is back out of it and say, wait a minute, how am I going to handle these real live market issues? You have to kind of step out of your um, right brain and move into your left brain a little bit and solve the problem, right? And so that's what my graduate work was about, and that's been my evangelical thing for all these years. I have a purple cow here because... Um, we've already talked about supply and demand. It's a simple premise. Too much supply, uh, you know, not enough demand for, to, you know, meet that supply or the supply exceeds the demand. Ergo, price goes down. It's the most basic economic formula that there is. So what do you have to do? Well, we've already talked about adding value today, right? This is where the, you know, that 10% that you're going to remember. Remember the adding value thing because that's all you can do. The purple cow is here. Has anybody ever read Seth Godin's books? Seth Godin, yeah, a couple of you wonky marketing guys, right? Seth Godin's a really interesting guy who's made a lot of money teaching people about marketing, and one of his most basic principles is if you're going to be, and it goes back to my cow herd, right? If you're going to be in the herd, you want to be a purple cow. Well, why do you want to be a purple cow? Because you're going to stand out. There aren't a lot of other purple cows. You want to be remarkable. In other words, you want people to remark about your work, right? You want to be special. So how do you, what are you doing there? You're adding value to what you're doing, okay? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second, about how to add value. And you have to do that through the lens of uh, rational business planning. This stuff makes people ill, rational business planning. When I taught this stuff at a college level, my art students with purple hair like a purple cow and, you know, stuff sticking through every piece of skin you could find, 
would come in at 7 o'clock in the morning for my business class, and they'd kind of go, oh, he's going to talk about business plans again. And they just hate it, but, you know, the 10% in that group who listened have succeeded. All right? So what is value? <laughs> yes, aren't they sweet? <laughs> they didn't write DOS. They bought it for, what did they spend? $1,800 or something. They added value to an existing product out there, an existing thing in the marketplace, right? Okay, so, but you say, I'm a journalist. I don't know anything about this. Well, you're not anymore just a journalist. You're a business person. I am, you know, very lucky in that I still get to go out and pick up cameras and audio equipment and this and that and go out and do stories. Um, and that's how I make my living. And it's about not 20% of my time, probably. Okay? The rest of my time is taken up by doing all the other stuff that I've got to do to run the business and that you're going to have to do. And this is coming up. So where do we add the value? Well, the value is not in doing that stuff. That's just like furniture in the room. The value is what you have in your heart. It's the way you tell the story. It's the way you build the brand, as we've been talking. The brand is you. The brand is your perception. The brand is your experience. The brand is what you can do that goes beyond what all those people with cell phones and, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the little video cameras, et cetera, can do. It's, it's your experience. Experience counts. It's your judgment. Judgment counts. Uh, it's not technical skills because my daughter, who's 16, has technical skills that are probably as good as mine or better. You know, these ki kids, these kids today, they know so much. So, so how do you build a business that's, that allows you to extract value and doesn't cripple you with all the other stuff? All right. So, so first of all, you got to set your goals and you have to do the math. I hate math. I've never been good at math. That's why I have a calculator. Um, but you have to do it. And once you start doing it, you start figuring out what things, you know, what, what, what's going on here. If you don't do it, you get crushed, right? The problem is it's hard for us to fit all this stuff in, all right? Look at all the things we got to do here. Have, has anybody here ever seen a fishbone graph before? Yeah, this, these are wonky business school things. Basically, and I didn't want to show you one because they're really ugly, but you look at, imagine if all the bones on that fish were, you know, sort of had type on them, and, and they're going to describe all the functions that your business has, right? There's going to be marketing. There's going to be uh, pre-production. There's going to be office management. There's going to be buying paper clips. There's going to be... Every little teeny weeny function that ever happened at any place that you had a job. And now you're doing it because nobody's going to hire you because flexible workforce. You know, you're the cows and you only get brought into the barn when you're needed to be milked. Okay? So you're going to have to figure out how to do all that stuff, which really is just infrastructure. It doesn't have any in intrinsic value to the product you're producing, which is your stories. And you're going to have to figure out how to have the time to do the stories, right? Problem. So you have to build a new structure, not the old little house, but the new big bridge to the future. All right. So it's a team effort. This is the point. This is the key here. We have to remember the tools themselves indicate where we're going with this. None of us are experts at video, audio, Photography, writing, interactive graphics, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? I, I, all those things. We each have some skills. I, I, the smart people in this business say, here are all the things that are part of it. Pick two and be the expert in those two, and then get some other people to work with you on the other stuff. Well, that extends right out beyond the actual content production into the business management. So that's what I'd like you guys to think about as you wander out there to do this stuff in the world. And you think about telling these great stories and what you can do with the stories. Also think, how am I going to create a structure that's going to support that for me? Because nobody's going to come along and do it okay, for you. So how do you build those teams? Well, what you want to do is you want to create a structure that is going to add, that's going to reduce the load on you and add value to what you do. So the total is going to be greater than the sum of the parts. That's a very old concept, right? And there's a lot of ways to do that. 
right? Because collaboration is always going to add things that you didn't expect it to add. So there's, on a creative level, it's very exciting to be in a collaborative environment. Um, and just on a strictly functional level, you really want to have people in a team who know how to, say, put together a financing package or know how to, um, you know, approach little functional business aspects of uh, managing uh, website development or something like that. Okay, so there's models out here. You know, I don't know how to do this. How can I figure this out? Well, there's existing models. And we haven't had to think about this much because we've been off in the newsroom and we let the business guys do the business stuff, right? But we have to start thinking about it. So I started looking around at a whole range of models. Video production is pretty interesting because it's very close to home for us, right? So uh, there's always been this division of labor. Uh, within video, there's some distinct differences, particularly as they relate to copyright ownership, and that gets pretty sticky. But there's always been this division of labor, and there's been this expectation. You go out with these video, I mean, I work a lot with video crews now, and I go out with these guys, and, you know, it's, it's a well-oiled machine, and everybody has the expectation because it's right there and up front. So if you're trying to see how, uh, you know, a collaborative media production uh, uh, company can work, look at little video companies. What's happening with video companies now is they're having to lean up though. Now this is kind of interesting. I was out on a shoot for AT&T last month and we only had a crew of 18 people and they were bitching that there weren't enough people around. And I'm going, this is a little top heavy to me. Do we need the caterer? You know? But, <laughs> But this is the environment they come from. And what I'm seeing now is, uh, and I, I've gone out and done the research and talked to people, I'm seeing um, people coming into, I'm seeing the art directors and the creative directors saying, well, we put this job out to bid in this video company. You know, everybody wants video, right? Video, 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 even if it's still photos produced as video. Uh, and these guys came back with a quarter million dollar bid, and we have $50,000 to spend. I'm going, I can do something for you for 50K? I can do a lot for 50K. So you have to look at that model and say, well, wait a second. They have all these people who have all kinds of different jobs out there in the production workflow. Everything from, you know, makeup to costumes to, you know, uh, going out and finding location scouting to, you know, all, all the production functions. And the guys who are taking the pictures are just a small part of it almost. So they're worth looking at, but on a new media kind of level where the, um, the scale of it is reduced so that it becomes more affordable for your uh, increasingly parsimonious client base. General contractors, I think, are kind of interesting. Who would think you have a lot in common with, uh, you know, the guy who built your house or whatever it might be? Well, an awful lot, as it turns out. There's huge advantages in coming to a client with one point of contact, just like a general contractor does. So let's say you want to create a multimedia piece of communication. You can walk into the client, and, and used to be that guys like me, we were way down the food chain. The art director, you know, would go from the client to the creative or to the account executive to the creative director to the art director to the media buyer to Dan. You know, well, I want to get up there, okay? Because there's more profit up there. There's all these layers kind of eat profit, right? So, so I want to get up higher. So if I walk in the door now with my knowledge base and my own personal skill set, I'm walking in the door and I'm saying, sure, we can produce that. You know? And I'm going, well, wait a minute. I just told this guy I was going to produce a website that had interactive this and video that, and I don't do all that stuff. But I got guys who do, right? From the client's perspective, they're dealing with, with a company, an entity, a production company. So they have a single point of contact. It's very convenient. I can show them work that I've done uh, and that my buddies have done. And we can capture a job by coalescing around specific projects. Right? So we can be bigger. Remember what we were saying a second ago? Be bigger than we really are by working together. And it provides a service for the client, convenience for the client. It gives us an opportunity to to do things we couldn't do individually. You can do that on a business level too. You can share computing systems that you, so you don't have to go out and get the latest, greatest system. You buy it together or lease it together under a jointly owned corporate entity. There's a lot of ways you can share those resources as well as sharing the marketing and branding position. Uh, small group medical practice is another one I kind of like, although those guys have kind of gotten ruined by the insurance industry. But 
bunch of um, orthopedic surgeons. There's usually a guy who does backs, guy who does knees, guy who does elbows, guy who does you know shoulders. They share an X-ray room, they share a cast room, they share an administrative staff, they share a billing staff. If each one of those guys had all that stuff themselves, they'd be broke. We do that now, which is one of the reasons little businesses like photography businesses go broke. Okay, so by delegating uh, and distributing the structures, we add efficiency. Businesses fail because of inefficiencies. They're either inefficiencies because they're too small, so you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off, you're trying to do everything, like I was up late doing this silly PowerPoint last night because I was overwhelmed with other stuff. It happens to me too. I don't take my own medicine as well as I should. But on the one end, you have little businesses that try and do too much and can't do well at any of it as a consequence. And this is happening a lot with people in our general line of work. And then on the other end, you've got big, huge corporations and entities that get more abundant and trip over themselves because of the, the size of their bureaucracies and they make stupid mistakes like BP and companies like that, you know. These things happen because they have efficiencies on the other end. The key is right-sizing it. The key is finding that place where the team works, where, where, you, can, um, where you can put together a group of people that have complementary skills and shared vision. Because you can, you can brand around the shared vision so that you all you know, are out there as a consistent entity in the eyes of your marketplace. And you can pull together the skill sets so that if I'm not good at it, one of my collaborators is. And then you have to set up, but this goes beyond this stuff. I mean, all this loosey-goosey stuff about, well, I'll find somebody on the internet. Bullshit. You may find somebody who can do an illustration for you. You're not going to do business with somebody on the internet as a viable business partner. It's not going to happen. You know, because you need the face time, you need the trust, you need the predictability. So using people like that as vendors, maybe even frequent vendors, is fine. But I, I think the business structures that work for people like in, you know, in this room, I assume, are, are tight little groups of people who you know, know each other and know that you can share. Like there's a couple of people right here in the middle of the room who I know and trust and I'm, I'm trying to get, a, we're trying to work a deal. We're going to do some web design and, you know, because we know each other and we've been talking about it for a long time. So I'm going to pull them in with my other guys and we're going to make a deal because I trust those guys. I wouldn't do that with somebody I'd never met before. Anyhow, our problem with this stuff really is the psychology. When I was first looking at business models a few years ago, I, I had an idea for how to scale these resources and create a, a, um, a business entity that would provide service to multimedia content producers um, by providing like the infrastructure, basically, the, the front office stuff, the computing stuff, so we could share that cost and everybody could get into it at a fraction of what they would have to pay themselves and have higher capability, right? It was a really good plan. The price was cheap. I could get everybody in. I could get half a dozen partners in for under three grand a month in overhead. They would have way more than they could ever have. And these guys are all going, I, I don't know if I can make three grand a month. If you can't make three grand a month, you're not in business. So go be a barista, you know? I mean, this is crazy. It's the psychological issue that gets in people's way. The, the other thing, the other component of that psychological issue is that uh, we are all, we all live in our caves, right? So, I mean, people who produce journalism and arty stuff are notoriously independent. So we kind of go hide in our caves, and we don't like to play in, with other people's toys. We don't like them playing with our toys, and it really hurts us. So we have to change that mindset. It's, it's just crippling us. Uh, by the way, it's the old geezers or the middle-aged geezers like me who are most crippled by it. The younger people get it because they've grown up in that collaborative environment. So if you hear footsteps, you middle-aged folks, watch out because they understand. So there's a lot of resources out there. Um, it, free for the taking. Uh, small business administration. Boy, I used to teach one of the classes I taught. We had they had to do um, the students all had to do business plans, right? I don't know how to do a business plan, Professor Lamont. Somebody actually called me that once. I thought it was so strange, and I said, "Go to the SBA." 
You know, there's huge free resources there. It's a great place to just get all the fundamental stuff you need. Uh, professional associations have been very involved with ASMP, the American Society of Media Photographers. I can't tell you how valuable those kinds of organizations are uh, in terms of professional training and support. They have resources for you. The Blue Earth Alliance, I was on the board for a few years. Uh, a couple of other Blue Earth people floating around here. They have a book on their website, which uh, Russell and I both had some authorship in, actually, um, called uh, Shooting from the Heart, which is a guidebook for people who want to do engaged, in-depth documentary photojournalism projects, be they multimedia, film, print, whatever. And it's got all the stuff, soup to nuts, uh, how to find funding, how to structure a project, uh, you know, how to, how to um, uh, do a, create a web presence, so i got one minute, and uh, it's all there for the taking. It's a PDF, uh, blueearth.org. Uh, local businesses, schools, and programs, obviously there's tons. Uh, the, one of the cool things, business schools, I think there's a great opportunity here. I've heard of a lot of businesses, creative businesses, who have, uh, or a handful, actually, who have gone to local business schools, like, you know, over at the UW, their, their uh, foster school of business, and said, hey, I've got this cool idea, but I don't know anything about business. Would you guys like to make it a project? Write me a business plan. Help me figure this out. You have expertise. And here's all these you know, wannabe MBAs. They're going to run in to help you. Uh, your friends. Storm's got an advisory board. I have sort of a kitchen cabinet, right? Um, I go around to people all the time, and I say, how did you do that? You know, my friend in the construction materials industry, I've talked to him about how he manages his business. I'm not going to get in that business, but I can learn from what he has to say. Your banker, your accountant, your lawyer, They'll all help you too, but you have to create those relationships and work them. The bankers in particular, you need to have the, a great business plan for your banker. And your bankers, they kind of love you because you're like a sort of strange pet to them. You know, they, they work in these very serious jobs all day, and then you come in and say, I'm a, I'm a multimedia photojournalist, and they go, wow, come on in. <laughs> Because they just think you have the coolest job in the universe. So uh, anyway, summary. Profit is not a dirty word. I know some of us kind of recoil against it and go, oh, God, you scummy profiteers. But it's not a dirty word because if you don't make a profit, you're going to go out of business. If you go out of business, if you can't eat, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to be able to do the job you set yourself up to do. You're not going to be able to pursue your passion. And so you need to make the, the business work. Uh, you want to build your brand around who you are. Unique stuff is what has value. Run-of-the-mill stuff is a commodity. Don't waste your time on it. Um, ally yourself with colleagues who have complementary skills and a shared vision. And do the math. If you do the math, you'll figure it out. Ta-da! <laughs>